Chapter 7. Wilderness Vanu Wilderness Vanu was Rayo and Roberta's preferred Vanu lifestyle after they discovered van nomadism was not freeing enough for them. It is the most radical and one of the most difficult, too. Your average individual in the Servile Society would likely be dead within a couple of weeks if they were airdropped into the middle of the wilderness. Since most folks would never seriously consider this as a viable option, I'm not going to spend much time on it. And for those that do, Rayo's Vanu publications will be far more worthwhile than any attempt I could make to explain it. Below is an article by Rayo from Vanu Life, March 1973, titled Smumans, the Super Hobos. Herein, you'll discover how such a nomadic wilderness lifestyle could be achieved, the various Vanu home bases involved, how interaction could be facilitated between other Smumans, and how various Vanu lifestyle changes can be combined, among other things. Enjoy! Smumans, the Super Hobos, by Rayo. Smume stands for Seclusion and Mobility Using Multiplicity. Smume has some features of and integrates with troglodyte, foot nomad, urban anonymity, and vehicle nomadic ways. But it differs in overall living pattern and equipment use. Smume has similarities to traditional ways as diverse as hobos, Eskimos, fur trappers with several overnight cabins, and wealthy families with several conventional houses. Many Smume lifestyles are possible, but all involve migration among various abodes. The abodes are usually simple, inexpensive, semi-permanent, and widely separated. A number of towns of a region are used, in secession, as trading outposts. Smume offers, in part, the wide-ranging mobility and anonymity of vehicle nomadism with the privacy and safety of troglodytism. While Smume is complicated to describe, at least with conventional concepts, Smume is easier to implement than any other lifestyle I presently know of which offers comparable vanu. Smume is made economical by the low cost of plastic film and secondhand utensils. A Smume family migrates between its abodes, probably seasonally, less often an abode is moved to a new site within the same area, or phased out in favor of a new abode developed elsewhere. Most of the abodes are located at least a quarter mile and not more than ten miles from a road. The road is preferably either a highway or a trail without habitation along it or at its intersection with the highway. Most abodes cannot be reached by motor vehicles. There are several hitchhiking routes from each abode to one or more such roads. Each route reaches the road at a different place and at a different out-of-sight residence. At least one route from each abode ends in a parking spot which is out of sight of the road and rarely used, suitable for unloading supplies. A few hundred yards into the brush from each parking spot is a stash for low-value supplies awaiting backpacking to the abode. The supplies are stored in drums for protection from animals and weather. Hiking routes are irregular and cannot be followed by someone not familiar with them. Each route is used only a few times a year, so it doesn't receive much wear. In Siskiyou region, abode sites are selected so that highway distance between is typically 100 miles. The separation is determined by the distance between major trade towns and the living patterns of conventional people. People rarely go 100 miles to work, shop, or socialize. Overland hiking distances between abodes is less, typically 30 to 40 miles. The abodes all lying within the same mountain range. A family has no single trading outpost. From each abode, a different town, or better yet, two or three in alteration are used for shopping, receiving forwarded mail, and perhaps temporary employment. The towns so used are fairly large, at least 5,000 people within shopping range, and they are located on major highways and thus accustomed to many visitors. After living at one abode a few months and making trips alternatively to the nearest suitable towns, which preferably lie in opposite directions, the family moves to another abode, 100 miles away, and makes trips to different towns, and so forth. They do not return to the first abode and the corresponding trading outposts until a year has passed. If a family has six abodes, twelve trading towns, and makes trips to town twice a month, one member is in each town twice a year, not often enough to be distinguishable from the many thousand travelers who stop briefly. The family is probably not limited to a fixed schedule or route. If they encounter trouble in one town, they do not return to that area for several years, meanwhile developing a new abode elsewhere. In an emergency, they can hike overland between abodes without using roads or going to populated areas. All possessions of a Smume family have one or more of the following characteristics. Inexpensive, expendable, small, used seasonally. Inexpensive items are duplicated and left at each abode. These might include polyethylene film and rope for rigging tents, bedding, cooking stove, utensils, extra clothes, and drums for storage while abode is not occupied. Bedding, clothes, and utensils are scavenged at dumps or purchased secondhand. Total cost of stationary items at warm weather abode is probably less than $50. Expendable supplies include food staples, soap, writing paper, kerosene, and propane. These are ordinarily left at an abode until consumed. 
Some small but valuable items move with the family, such things as a watch, transistor radio, binoculars, handgun, radiation detector, camera, medical kit, sewing kit, and often used reference books. Seasonal items are grouped according to use at specific abodes. These include most books, tools, and construction materials. Each abode is somewhat specialized for the activities performed there and the season that it is used. Abodes might include summer camp. This might be more remote than other abodes since there will usually not be snow and swollen rivers to hinder access. If foraging and Vanu horticulture are accomplished in that area, books, tools, and preservation equipment are stored there. A plastic tent and mosquito netting are sufficient shelter. Winter abode. This may be a semi-underground structure or a large foam hut plus a plastic tent. Since there is little warm working space, much reading and writing are done here. Most books are stored there. Electric abode. A small generator, probably hydroelectric, powers a sewing machine, electronic equipment, or any other gear requiring electricity, but not bulky imports. Relevant books and material are stored there. Edge place. This is for work involving bulky imported materials such as carpentry and is the one abode accessible to vehicles. Major work on any vehicle is performed there, also any work which because of space required, noise or smells is not easily vanued. Edge Place is most likely on fairly secluded private land leased from a friendly landowner. An old van or house trailer may be parked there to provide sheltered work and storage space. Edge Place is much less vanu than other abodes, so work requiring much privacy is not performed there. And any family members especially threatened, such as slave-aged children during that season, remain elsewhere. A minimally furnished van may be used for shelter if one or more members occasionally go into that society to earn money. When not in use, it is probably parked on private land, perhaps at Edge Place. A friend who may be outside the Siskiyou region provides a permanent mailing address. The friend accumulates mail, bundles it, then sends it as a parcel, as directed. If possible, the family makes arrangements with trustworthy local people in each town to receive parcels. If not, the parcels come general delivery. A legal home address for driver's license and vehicle registration, if needed, is probably arranged in a large city outside the region and separate from the mailing address. Means of transportation vary. One smewman may not have any vehicle. E. Hitchhikes for mail and light supplies. Also for migration between abodes. E. Hires a van for pickup. Preferably a transient to haul heavier supplies. Another smewman may use a motorcycle for all transport. This will be a bike with enough power for a highway, yet light enough to manhandle into hiding places, perhaps a 250cc trail bike. Still another may have a van or camper for hauling supplies as well as for work excursions. E will also have a motorbike or else hitch rides, since places suitable for long-time parking will seldom be convenient to unloading spots. Smewmans, like other Vanuans, obtain money in ways which minimize time and involvement with the Servile Society. One may have a line of special services or products E sells through merchants in the town E visits. Another may have a mail order enterprise. Someone with a highly paid skill may journey to a distant city for temporary employment. But most, at least at first, will probably depend on day labor in nearby towns and seasonal crop work. Although this is low paying, a smewman's expenses can be very low. So not many a day's works are needed. An individual or family without slave age children can be flexible about outside employment, working together or separately at any time of the year. A family with children is more constrained. Perhaps during the school year, the children remain at a secluded site. Then, during summer, the whole family does crop work and any other activities involving that society. If asked for addresses by employers or bludgies, a smewman gives her legal home address. If asked for local addresses, E says E is visited by some friends, location vaguely defined. A smewman can be opener with outsiders than he can be with more stationary wilderness vanuans. In some instances, E may be able to socialize with local non vanuans E can even say to friends, E is camping back in the woods, knowing E will have moved on to other woods before the word gets very far. For a smewman, the whole Siskiyou region becomes, in a sense, a single, widely dispersed city of several hundred thousand people. Smeum offers much of the anonymity of metropolis without the pollution or nuclear danger. Assets are dispersed and cannot be destroyed by a single misfortune. Comparing Smeum to full-time van living, most time is spent in or around abodes which are concealed away from roads in rugged, brushy areas, rarely, if ever, penetrated. With our van, the greatest mean time to harassment we have achieved is one or two years, whereas a single small tent we can easily achieve 20 years mean time to harassment. With more work and care, 200 years. Interpretation, if there are 200 such camps, an average of one a year will be discovered. This is while a camp is set up torn down and stuffed in drums under bushes, chance of discovery is even lower. 
We have had enough stash tents in enough situations to have confidence in the 20-year figure. One-year MTH is adequate for someone not especially threatened who wants peace and quiet. It is not sufficient for slave-age children, someone without acceptable ID, or for most kinds of alternate economy enterprises. A serious disadvantage of SMUM for some. Activities must be accomplished at certain places and in certain seasons, rather than when one is in the mood. Planning and bookkeeping are essential. Life is more structured than with everything in one place. But the structure is chosen by oneself, not imposed by outsiders. One might initiate a SMUM lifestyle by exploring a region on foot and hitchhiking, using lightweight camping gear, then gradually build equipment and supplies at the most desirable spots. Or a van nomad might develop a string of vehicle squat spots, then use these as bases for scouting. On the other hand, from a SMUM lifestyle, one can become, say, a troglodyte by further developing one abode and phasing out the others. Like any new lifestyle, SMUM should be begun when one is not in immediate danger when one has time to experiment and can survive a few mistakes.